This is a simple prototype that uses I2C. I have a microcontroller and a sensor that reports ambient temperature and an object temperature. Ever wonder how these devices can communicate with one another? This is possible because of the I2C protocol, and in this tutorial, you will learn how to do it too. I2C or Interintegrated Circuit is one of the most common features in embedded electronics. It allows our devices to talk to one another and exchange important information. I'm working on an automated way to detect high body temperature from a short distance. So after doing a bit of research online, I found this MLX90614 non-contact temperature sensor. And I found a version that comes in a development board by MicroE in RS components to make things a lot easier for my prototyping. Luckily I got one delivered before they ran out of stock. I imagine the demand for sensors like this at this time is incredibly high due to the global pandemic. So strangely enough, this is something we should consider when designing an electronics project. Having said that, I also got this TC74 sensor because it also measures temperature and uses I2C. More importantly, the stock is high. Although this is a contact sensor, I chose it as an alternative so that you can still apply I2C hands-on if you can't get the non-contact one. Sometimes alternative parts that behave similarly are also useful when building prototypes while the final part is not yet available. Great, now let's jump straight into learning the protocol. The most important elements for a practical understanding of I2C are the devices, bus, and signal format. Let me first explain the devices and the bus together. Devices are normally classified as master and slave. However, I choose not to use those classifications and instead call them the main and secondary devices. Just keep in mind that in textbooks and other resources, you would see the previously mentioned terms. There can be multiple main and secondary devices. But let's focus on just one of each. The main device controls the bus and send commands or requests for information from the secondary. Typically, the main device is a microcontroller. On the other hand, is the secondary device, which can send information to the main device. You may have noticed both main and secondary can transfer information, but again to emphasize, the bus is controlled by the main. Some common examples of secondary devices are sensors, memory chips, and data converters. Other microcontrollers can even be used as secondary devices too. Okay, not too difficult so far. I keep saying the word bus since earlier. I know what you're thinking, but not this. To put it simply, a bus is a general name used to describe wires which carry data. In I2C's case, the bus is formed of two wires. Connect one wire to the SCL pin and the other to the SDA pin, short for serial clock and serial data. Just like this. For any microcontroller or device that you have, you can always refer to its datasheet to see the pin out and learn where the serial clock and data pins are. My setup is already complete, but hold on, let me clarify. The I2C bus actually needs something called pull-up resistors. They're no different from ordinary ones. They just connect the pins to the voltage source, pulling the voltage of the bus, hence its name. Going back to the setup, the pull-up resistors are already included in the development board, and I can even check using my multimeter that the 10K resistors are in fact there. If I use an ordinary part, like this TC74 temperature sensor as an example, I'll have to put the pull-up resistors myself. And just like that, it's a full-fledged I2C bus. I hope you can see now how simple and cost-effective this is to implement on hardware. Now we have a pretty basic understanding of the devices and the bus. This is already great progress, so well done! I need you to focus just a little bit more on the next part, but I promise you'll get it. What are the signals in I2C? These are the data transferred between the main and secondary. For example, since we have a temperature sensor, we can expect that the data will hold the temperature information that the sensor is measuring. How does the sensor tell the microcontroller this information? This temperature data is sent in a specific way. This is exactly what the I2C standard specifies. First things first, imagine the sensor is reading 25 degrees Celsius. Does it say 25 to the microcontroller? Well, yes and no. It says 25, but in binary form. You may or may not be familiar with binary digits, but the number 25 is the same as this. For us humans, this could be quite difficult to read, but from the point of view of the devices, these ones and zeros are as easy as 1, 2, 3, or better yet, 
1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. The 1 is achieved when the signal is equal to the voltage source, like 5 volts, and 0 is achieved when the signal is equal to ground, or 0 volts. Then, by switching between 1 and 0, the number 25 is formed. And if I plot it versus time, it will look like this. By the way, since these signals represent data, these signals are sent on the wire connected to the serial data or SDA pin. The main and secondary must be in step with each other so that each of them know when to send and listen for signals. Remember the other bus wire? That's right, the one connected to the SEL pins or serial clock. As the name suggests, this is the clock used as reference by the devices. The clock signal switches between 5 volts and 0 volts, high and low. 1 and 0. If you're curious to know how, inside the device there is a transistor. To make it easy to understand, you can think of it as a switch. Whenever the switch is open, 5 volts is measured because there is no current in the circuit and there is no voltage drop on the resistor. When the switch is closed, current is flowing and the voltage goes down to 0 volts at this point. The pull-up resistor makes it possible to achieve these voltages. Be careful though, because if the resistance is too low, the current becomes larger and can damage the devices, and we don't want that. Typically, the resistances used are 4.7 to 10 kilo ohms. I also want to note that this is an ideal model of the operation. In reality, the values can be slightly lower than the voltage source and slightly higher than 0 volts. The reason being, in our example, we used a switch but in application, it is a transistor that would have some effect to these measurements. But we don't have to worry too much about these details when we only want to use I2C. If we combine the graphs together like this, we can then see how the devices see these signals. They look at the signal on the data bus when the signal on the clock is high. The signal should stay high or low the entire time that the clock is high so that the bit can be considered valid. When the clock is low, then the signal on the data line is allowed to change. You might be wondering, how long does it take for the sensor to send these 8 bits that can be interpreted as 25 degrees Celsius? Well, the standard speed of the I2C bus is 100 kilobits per second. That means in 1 second, 100,000 bits can be present. To put into perspective, an average blink is about 100 milliseconds. So if you blink once, 8 bits can be transferred over a thousand times. Don't you think that's interesting? With only these two very common wires, in a fraction of a blink, the devices can exchange valuable information like temperature. Very cool. Get it? Cool? Temperature? No? Okay, moving on. Now in application, the temperature data is only actually a part of the entire exchange that takes place between the microcontroller and sensor. When the temperature was sent from the sensor to the microcontroller, we didn't really see how the bus was controlled or how the main device requested for the data in the first place. So let's unpack that now. We will use the MLX90614 datasheet as reference to explain how data is transferred through I2C. Different devices will have some variation, but all of them will follow the general steps. This is what I meant when I said signal format earlier and how I2C makes compatibility possible. Alright, first it says send start bit. This is how the main device takes control of the bus. When both the clock and data lines are continuously high and the data line transitions low, then the start condition is initiated. Next, the main sends on the data line the address of the secondary. The address is on the secondary device's datasheet and often comes pre-programmed and made up of 7 bits. At the end of the same byte is the read or write bit. The main device sends this to say if it wants to read or write to the secondary. Since at this time the main device is sending a command, then it should send a write. In I2C standards, a write is a zero. The secondary sends an acknowledge bit, then the main device proceeds to send the command in an 8-bit format. For this device, the command we want to issue is like tell me the object temperature. There are several commands shown on the datasheet. After sending the command and getting an acknowledgement, a repeated start condition is initiated. This means the main device still wants control of the bus. Then, similar to step 2, the address is sent again. But this time, a read bit is sent instead of the previous write. A read is done by sending a 1. Since the command was given and the main has now sent the read bit, the secondary will now send the temperature data in the form of 16 bits or 2 bytes, as specified in the datasheet. In between the bytes, the main should send an acknowledge bit. 
and when the two bytes are received, the main can send a not acknowledged bit. This is often done at the end before finally sending a stop bit. This is the complete picture of the I2C exchange. To drive the point home, here's the signal format for the TC74 temperature sensor. You can see how similar the two are. And even though we're using devices from different manufacturers, they're compatible with one another because the I2C protocol specifies how communication is performed. So that's it with just a few steps, data was exchanged between two devices, and it's easy to scale this up to plenty of devices that you can use for your project. That wasn't too bad, right? To summarize, in I2C there are main and secondary devices which communicate with one another. The exchange of data takes place on the I2C bus made up of two wires, and the data signals are formatted in such a way that they follow the I2C protocol. In the next part of this tutorial, I'll show step by step how the programming is done for these two sensors. And once you learn that, you should be confident in using I2C for other applications. I hope you had fun learning about the fundamentals of I2C. If you did, please go ahead and click the thumbs up button. And if you want to see more videos like this, click that subscribe button too, and I will see you in the next video.